So my name is Tim Chevalier, and I'm a research engineer in Mozilla Research. I have a small but vibrant research group, and I'm going to talk to you today about the Rust programming language, which is a new language we've been developing at Mozilla for uh, the past couple years. I've been on the project for two years. So this is mostly a talk about how to use the language, how to write code in it, but my background is in programming language design and implementation, so I couldn't resist putting in a little bit about language design. So we designed Rust to bridge the performance gap between safe and unsafe languages. And when I say unsafe, I'm mostly talking about C and C++. And when I say safe, I'm talking about pretty much everything else, Java, Haskell, ML, Ruby, Python, all of those languages. And if there's anything about Rust that seems a little bit surprising or kind of complicated at first, I hope that I'll be able to convince you that it's mostly a choice that fell out of that requirement that we had to, um, to provide both safety and good performance. And since this is an open source conference, I should say Rust compiler and all of its tools are open source, dual licensed under MIT and Apache. So I want to talk about the domain that we're working in, which is systems programming. And systems programming is a term that's a little bit hard to define, but the best definition I could come up with that is that it refers to writing efficient code in environments that are resource constrained, where you're interfacing with hardware quite closely or directly. And in this area, it's really all about C and C++. Um, and the reason for that is not just because people don't like change, um, or they don't want to try something different, but it's that systems programmers care about very small performance margins. So choices that would be totally acceptable when writing most types of applications, like the choice to use garbage collection for managing all memory, for example, is not something that systems programmers will accept because of you know 5% performance loss is going to really matter to them, even though to most programmers in the world it's not going to matter. So there's as, as much as people like me who come from functional programming hate to admit it, there is a reason why C is still dominant, but C has plenty of shortcomings, as I'll show you. So all of these types of errors are things that happen in the wild and that really cause security vulnerabilities and cause people to be embarrassed, cause money to be lost, sometimes even lives. There's this quote that I like from Tony Hoare, who's a language designer about how the introduction of pointers that can be null was the billion dollar mistake, like that just shouldn't have happened. And, and these are all types of errors that modern programming language technology can prevent. And the question is, how do we bring that to a language without paying any extra in performance? So there's another quote from uh, another programming language person named Robin Milner, um, well-typed programs don't go wrong. And what he meant was that um, when, when we say go wrong, we're talking about all of the same kinds of errors in the previous slide, mostly ones to do with memory safety. And we designed REST type system to be sound. And what that means is we can predict what your program is going to do based on the fact that the compiler accepted it and said, yes, I'm going to accept this. It's type correct. And then knowing that you know what your program is going to do without having to understand the details of the particular compiler or interpreter that you're using. And I always like to say that gives you more confidence, not complete confidence, because compilers can have bugs. Runtime systems can have bugs. We, we can know that our system is sound, but the implementation of it can always fall short of that. So in Rust, we try to keep the basic model that C has um, that lets you closely understand the relationship between your code and the machine that it's running on. And the reason why that's important is that it makes it easy to write efficient code for the machine, because you're always thinking about operations on the actual hardware and not higher level language operations. So we want that to be still true in Rust as well. This is really important, um, for example, at NASA, and other places where people care a lot about reliability, there are people who get paid to manually look at C programs on the left and output of the, of the C compiler on the right and visually look at that to make sure there wasn't a bug in the compiler that changed the meaning of the code. And that's a very labor-intensive process, but it's worth it if you're going to lose a space shuttle if something goes wrong. So that is kind of the extreme example of why C's closeness to the hardware is useful. So we want to match C idioms where they matter, particularly, as I'll talk about, with respect to memory allocation. But we want to bring in additional safety. And I use the term memory safety already. So what does that mean? Well, one definition of that is that programs only ever 
dereference previously allocated pointers that had not yet been freed. So you can't, what it means is you can't just make up a number and say, I'm going to treat this as a pointer, and I'm going to, I want to find out what's at that address, because that could be pointing into some other process's memory that you don't have permission to see, and that just wouldn't be safe. And we want to do that without runtime costs. So there are known solutions to the problem of memory safety, as in Java, Python, and Haskell. Um, you box everything, you garbage collect everything, and slightly separately, you implement method calls using dynamic dispatch. And those things work well in these languages, but they all have a runtime cost. So in Rust, we tried to focus on zero cost abstraction. So this is a term that Robert O'Callaghan, who is a researcher at Mozilla, wrote about. Um, you want to have additional expressivity in your language that doesn't come with an additional runtime cost. And oftentimes, when we're working in a safer language, we come up with lots of cool abstractions, but we don't necessarily think about what they're going to cost at runtime. So um, nothing comes for free. So in Rust, we do have additional cognitive overhead that we wouldn't have in one of these safe languages in my first bullet point. So we have to think about data representation and memory allocation, and that is additional effort. But what you get in return is the ability to write solid code without having additional runtime costs. And moreover, the compiler is going to check your assumptions for you. So you're not flying blind, but you know that if you do something that would cause unsafety, the compiler is going to say, you can't do that. So here's how the rest of the talk is going to go. The one big point I want you to take away is that it is possible to write systems code in a language where the compiler checks that you're using patterns and idioms safely. Um, and I want to encourage you to stop me and ask questions at any point if anything isn't clear, because if something isn't clear to you, there's probably 10 more people who are wondering about the same thing. So feel free to ask clarifying questions during the talk. Just wave your hand. And if you have more in-depth questions or comments, um, save that for the period at the end, because I'll try to leave some time. So um, I'm going to talk about Rust's type system and about something called traits in Rust. And then I'm going to switch gears and talk about pointers and memory in Rust. I'm going to hope that people ask a lot of questions, because I have an example that is not quite as good as I hoped it would be. So I'm going to hope that I could skip that. So you should ask a lot of questions. And then a few miscellaneous things about Rust, like automatic testing and benchmarking. And I'll try to leave at least 15 minutes for questions at the end. And this is not a you know get out your laptops and type along with me during the talk kind of talk, although you could if you happen to already have Rust installed. Um, so it's not quite that kind of a tutorial, but my goal is to break down the intimidation factors so that rather than I'm going to teach you Rust, I'm going to give you a sense of why you would want to go learn it on your own later on. And I also want to say that I've simplified some of the code examples for clarity because it's hard to introduce four new concepts on the same slide. So not all of the code is going to compile if you paste it in as is. But when I post my slides, I'm going to try to document where I had to make those changes. So let's get right into it. So the first thing in Rust that may not be familiar that I want to talk about is explicit mutability. So in Rust, when you declare a local variable, it's immutable by default, which means once you've assigned to it, you can never assign to it again. So in this code fragment, I've written a declaration. That's what our declarations look like, let x equals 5 and then a semicolon. And then um, I have this other variable I'm declaring called y, and I've declared it with this qualifier mute. So that means that I can assign to y later on, but I can't assign to x. So that line of code, y gets x, is fine. And then when I write x gets x plus 1, the compiler is going to tell me you can't do that because the thing on the left-hand side of the assignment operator has to be something that's mutable. And we made this choice because it turns out accidental mutability is a huge source of bugs. It's better to have to declare when you meant to make something mutable and to have the default be immutable. And notice that that's sort of an in-between between many languages where everything's mutable and a language like Haskell where nothing is mutable. It's actually possible to have something in between. And a really basic point, but one that can be very confusing at first, is the difference in Rust between statements and expressions. So we have two kinds of statements. Both of them end with a semicolon. The first one you just saw, that's the variable declaration. So let name of a variable equals an expression. And then the second form is just an expression. And what's an expression in Rust? Well, everything is an expression. Everything has a value. 
um, much like in a functional language, but don't worry if you haven't used one. So that particular code is equivalent to saying let and then some name I'm not going to use again equals expression. So because Rust evaluates everything that you write, which is typical in any language that's not lazy, um, so it's just equivalent to saying just that I'm going to ignore the result. And many kinds of expressions only are executed for their side effects, and we give those the type called um, unit or nil, um, which is written open paren, close paren. And that's how we manage to make it so that everything can have a value. Even an assignment statement has a value, it's just the unit value. So Rust has functions, as we would expect. Um, the distinction I'm trying to get at here is these two functions mean exactly the same thing. Both of them take an int and return the square of that int. In the first function, I've written the body of the function as x times x. Notice that there's no semicolon after that. And this is a piece of type correct code because in REST, the body of the function is taken as an expression that evaluates to its result. And its result type is declared as int. And that's what you get back. And in the second case, I've written an explicit return. And in this case, that has exactly the same meaning. So you can write a return here. You can leave it out. That's up to you. The, use, the actual usefulness of return is when you're returning early from a function. Um, but uh, in the case where you're just, you kind of only have one path through it, the return is optional. And I should mention that Rust mostly has type inference. In general, you can leave out type declarations when you're declaring variables. Um, but when you're writing a top-level function like one of these, you have to declare its argument types and result types. Those won't be inferred for you. Yeah? So if, if, if the first one is multi-line, would you, is the last line not the semicolon? Um, so it's, pos it's possible to, if you had a bunch of assignment statements or other function calls up here, that would be perfectly allowed. It's just if the last um, thing that you write doesn't have a semicolon after it, that last expression in the block, so the thing in curlase is a block, is taken as the value of the entire block. Is that clear? And if there is a semicolon, it's nil. And if there's a semicolon, then the, um, the type of the entire thing is nil. So if I had written x times x semicolon, that would be saying evaluate x times x, but throw away the result. And in this case, that would be a type error because it's returning int. So that's something that people get a little confused by at first, but it's not hard. Yeah? Uh, are semicolons required except for that last one? Um, semicolons are, well, yes and no. So a semicolon is required when you want to turn an expression into a statement. Um, and there's context where you can only have a statement, like for example, a block, which is the thing in Curly's, is a list of statements. So that's where you would need a semicolon. But there are places where you have the choice of writing either a block with something with a semicolon after it inside, or just writing the thing inside without the block and without the semicolon. I think this might become a little clearer with a few more examples. Good questions. And Rust has pointers. So um, C and C++ are languages that have explicit pointers. So you can write a pointer to something, and it's different from the thing it points to. And Rust is the same way. Many languages don't have any idea of explicit pointers. Actually, in those languages, usually everything is a pointer. Or in Java, for example, almost everything, things that are object types, are things that are implemented as pointers. And there's a few basic types that are not. But So this may be new to some people, is all I'm trying to say. But it's not a hard concept. So in this code, I'm writing um, an integer x that's the result of calling some function f. I don't care what f is here. And I'm writing explicit types here just to make things clearer. You can, act when you can leave those out when you're actually writing code. So the syntax at int means pointer to int. There is actually more than one kind of pointer. But for now, you can just think that at int means pointer to int. And I'm saying I'm assigning to y the result of taking the value of x, the thing I just declared, and putting it in a box on the heap. So in this code, x is something that's going to live on the stack in a slot here, which say f returns 5, so it'll have the number 5. And then the meaning of the second line of code is, well, I'm going to take another stack slot and put a pointer in that stack slot. And that pointer is just an address of some new box that I'm going to allocate in the heap. Um, 
So that's all that's going on here. And then, as in C, I can dereference y um, by writing star y. And I can assert that what it points to is equal to 5. And so the code is fine so far, but I wouldn't be able to write a line that says assert y equals 5, because y and 5 have different types. y is a pointer to int, and 5 is an int. So that doesn't make sense. So the difference between pointer and pointed to is pretty important for this talk, so I wanted to review that. And we also have a notion of mutability for pointers, just like we have for local variables. So um, I'm using an ampersand here, which again, you can just think of as another kind of pointer. Think of it as being the same as that. Um, so here I'm declaring a mutable local variable that will have the value 5 to begin with. And I'm calling some function called increment, which I actually define here. So what does increment take? It takes a mutable pointer to an int. So it's allowed to say, I'm going to dereference that pointer and assign into it the result of adding 1 to whatever it points to. And after this call, it's going to be true that x equals 6. If I had just written x without the at mute, it would have passed x by value. And so whatever increment did would have had no effect on x at the call side here. So, um, so that's how we do mutability in references. So next, I'm going to talk about enumerations, which are a type system feature that C has as well, but they don't quite work the same way. So enumerations are all about writing code in a way that allows us to know that we are checking all of the cases for a piece of data that need to be checked. We're uh, enumerating all of the types that a particular thing could be. So in Rust, we could define this color type that says, well, a color can either be red, green, or blue. And those are just symbols that um, the use of them is to know that if we have something of type color, it must have been constructed with one of those three things. And in C, we have an enum construct that looks very similar, but as you see, as you'll see, it doesn't quite have the same meaning. So C has um, two major problems. Um, first of all, that you are not required to be exhaustive when you're checking things in the color type in this example. And the second one is that you can have cases that are nonsensical, as I'll show you. So in Rust, we have what's called pattern matching. So we have a construct called match. And you can match, it turns out, on many different things in Rust. But for now, let's just stick to enum types. Um, first of all, note that f has the return type unit because its return type has been omitted. So that's just a little bit of syntactic sugar. You don't have to write arrow units. So here we're matching on a color C. And we're saying, if it's red, we'll do something. If it's green, we'll do something else. If it's blue, we'll do something else. So that's pretty straightforward. We have patterns on the left, which for now are just going to be the names of constructors. And on the right, we have codes. So in C, we use the switch statement instead. And we're switching on C. And superficially, the code looks pretty similar. We have a case for red, green, and blue. But we also have to put in these break statements. So that's a little bit annoying. If we don't put in the breaks, the code just falls through. And you'll execute all three cases for the same piece of data. So we can't make that mistake in Rust. So some problems. In Rust, the code on the left would be type incorrect, because we've put 17 as a pattern on the left. And that would be valid if C was an integer. But we distinguish colors from integers in the type system, even though do deep down, a color is just going to be a small integer. But we don't expose that to you as the programmer. So that's going to be rejected. Whereas in C, you could write exactly the same code, and the compiler would be perfectly happy with that. And it's kind of a good idea to reject this, because it probably means a programmer error. So we do reject it in Rust. More importantly, in Rust, we check for non-exhaustive matches. So here we've left out the case for blue. And the compiler is going to say, I don't know what you're talking about. And on the right, in C, we've left out the case for blue. And the compiler doesn't care. It's just going to fall through to the code after the switch. So this is a, you know, really important when you're, when you're changing your data type. Say you add one new possible color. Now you have maybe 50 functions that all use colors. You're going to have to go add cases for the new color in them. And with exhaustiveness checking, you will know that the compiler will find all of them for you. So that's something that's really important for quality. At the same time, there is very little runtime cost, because these are implemented just the same way as C enums are. So where we go beyond C is that enums also can have fields.
So there's a type called the option type, and I'm just going to talk about options of ints for now. So the option type is just basically a way of making null pointers explicit and putting them in the type system so that you have to check for them. So you can think of this as a pointer to an int that could be null, uh, except we've just turned into, into a data type instead of leaving that um, implicit. So you can do kind of the same thing in C, but it's a little bit awkward. So in C, you would, also, you would define this with a structure instead of an enum, and this is what an idiom that's called a tagged union. So you would say, OK, I have a Boolean flag that says, is this thing a none or is it a sum? And then as, as the other struct field, I have something called a union. So in C, a union means that this could either be a value or it could be, in this case, void, so no value at all. And which one is it? Well, you kind of have to keep track of that yourself by passing around this extra tag field. The compiler's not going to help you. And I'll show you what I mean in the next slide. So in C, if we're working with one of these int option things, suppose we have a function that gives us a random one, and we can write this code saying, well, I'm going to look at the is sum field, and I'm going to say, is it sum of an integer? And if so, I'm going to print out the value field of it. So that's perfectly fine, perfectly good code. But what if you left off if? What if you just unconditionally wrote printf of whatever it is and op.val? So C would let you do that, because there is no way of checking statically whether the union inside the struct is going to be a value or it's going to be a void thing. So Rust protects you from that mistake. So the only way in Rust to access a field of a thing that, was the, of a thing that has an enum type is to write a pattern that destructures it. So we're saying here, again, we have a random opt. If it's none, we're not going to do anything. We indicate that by the unit value. And if it's sum of i, we're going to bind this name i, which is a new name that we're creating, to the thing inside it, and we're going to print it out. So because that's the only way to access a field, you can't just dereference it. We know that you're only going to do it when there is a value. Yeah? Are none and sum built in? Um, none and sum um, are not built in. They can be defined um, in the language as part of a library, and I believe they actually are. Um, so you can define lots of types like this that are all just part of libraries that aren't magic or anything. Can they be in a way that's generic across or other Yeah, I'm going to get to that in a couple slides. Um, many people will probably see that coming. So the summary of this is that Rust checks that we covered every case. It also checks that we don't have cases that overlap, um, which is also probably an error. So enums are how to create data, and pattern matching is how to deconstruct data and get to its components. And the matches get checked to make sure we're using data in a way that's safe. Just a little side note, I wanted to introduce vectors, so I thought I would introduce pattern matching on vectors as well. So in Rust, a vector is much like an array. Um, it's automatically bounds checked. So if you go outside of bounds at runtime in a vector, that will cause your program to fail. Um, in this case, we're pattern matching on a vector. So we're saying, well, I'm going to make this vector with 1, 2, and 3 in it. And this is a little silly since we already know what it is. But just to show the syntax, we're saying, well, if the first element is 1 and then the rest is anything, we're going to bind the name tail to it. We're going to do one thing. And then if the first element is anything else, but it's still non-empty, we're going to do something else. And finally, if it's empty, we're going to do something else. And we're still going to check that all the cases are exhaustive. So vectors are used pretty pervasively in Rust, where in some languages you might use lists, or others you might use arrays. We use vectors. Yeah. Does the array have overhead built in? So there's actually several kinds of arrays. Um, that'll become more clear when I talk about memory management in Rust. So the answer is not necessarily. So in the sort of cheapest case, you can allocate arrays on the stack. And that's kind of just like allocating an array on the stack. There's no overhead. but. It can, be main it can be maintained statically. So when you know um, when something is an array literal, it's basically as cheap as you would expect. So where the size is statically obvious, it is obvious to the compiler as well. When you're dealing with something that's dynamically sized, there is a little bit more overhead. But that'll become clearer when I talk about memory management. Um, so Rust also has structs like C does. And similarly to in C, 
fields are laid out contiguously in memory, you can rely on the fact that they're going to be in the order that you declare them in, which can be important for interfacing with foreign libraries or hardware or whatever. But in C, it's a separate thing to allocate the memory for a struct and then to initialize fields. So you can happily in C allocate a bunch of memory on the heap, maybe for a struct, and then like forget to initialize one field and possibly go on and dereference it later, which would be an error at runtime. But Rust guarantees that if you can refer to a struct field, you can initialize it. So here's an example. Um, this is actually from Servo, which is our prototype web browser written in Rust. So here's an HTML element that's a structure that represents it. So we have a parent, which is a node, and that's another type that's defined just like this. And we have a tag name. Um, so for example, if we made a paragraph, supposing we had a function to do it, we would know that the tag name is p. And we have a list of attributes, so that's a vector like I showed you before. So, um, so those are structs, pretty much works the way you would expect. Rust has closures as well, so this is something that's maybe a little more, a little less likely to be known about. So a closure is an anonymous function, and here's an example. Um, in the purple circle is a function that takes an x, so that's how we write a function of x, vertical bar is x, and then there's a block that is the result of returning that or applying that function to a given argument. So this is just a function that does squaring, and this is maybe the most boring higher order function example ever. It just takes an argument and it takes a function and applies the function to the argument. But this is just showing that in Rust you can pass functions as arguments to other functions. And this ends up being quite useful for defining many different kinds of control structures, among other things. So for loops in Rust look a little bit different than the for loops that you might be familiar with. So here's an example. So what this code does is take the range from 0 to 10 and it um, prints out each of the numbers in that range, which is not that interesting. But um, what's mildly interesting is that in a language that's like, a, say, a functional language, you would write this code by first generating a vector of numbers from 0 to 10 and then consuming that vector. So you'd be allocating some extra memory and then throwing it away. But range is an iterator. It's an example of an iterator. So it really just takes this closure and applies it to each of the elements in that range without creating an intermediate data structure. And so range isn't magic. It's just defined in the standard library. And you can define your own thing like it. Yeah? Um, good question. So why does format have a bang? So in Rust, we have this macro called format that's kind of meant to do what printf does. And in Rust, um, macros, which are compile time syntax extensions, are written with a bang after the name. And that's so it's when you're looking at code, it's really obvious what's a macro and what's not. So that's not too important right now. But in case you were wondering, that's why. Um, so the cool thing about these for loops is that you can write your own looping constructs, and people do. And it, as long as you give it a particular type signature, um, you know that it's going to work with for, which is a built-in keyword. And I'll show you in the next slide that this turns into code that's just as fast as for loops in C. So the purple arrows, arrows are things that the compiler does, so you don't have to think about this unless you want to understand the compiler. So first of all, we're sort of superficially changing this code so it says, well, I'm calling this function called range, and the third argument is a closure that does the thing to each element. Um, so I'm just moving that function inside the parens. And then the compiler does inlining, which just means replacing the name of a function with its definition. So when you fill in the definition for range, what you get is a while loop. So Rust has while loops as well. It's just that we usually use for loops, except when we're implementing things that do iteration. So this is just a while loop that pretty much does what you would expect. So that's code that's just as efficient as the same code you would write in C. And um, it's, it's turned, you know, code has turned from stuff with higher order functions into loops. So that's pretty neat, I think. Yeah? Yeah, you're right. I guess I have an off by one error here, but you got the idea. That's not anything deep. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, for, well, for some reason, I guess I decided to change the meaning of the code while I was writing this example. So yeah, um, there's a, another function you could use that would step down instead of stepping up, and I guess that's what I had in mind here. 
But, um, but yeah, this should be stepping up from 0 to 10. So I don't know why I did that. So Rust is what we like to call a multi-paradigm language, which means it doesn't impose a single programming paradigm on you. So it does have syntax for methods. And you can write code that at least on the surface looks like object-oriented code. So here's an example. So first of all, I need to define a type that I'm operating on. So the methods for that type in Rust are separate. They're not part of the type itself. So I've defined this pair structure with a first and a second field. And then I write this thing called an impulse. So an impulse is like a collection of methods that I can call on a particular type. So here's one method. Um, so the method has this special self argument. And self in Rust is always the name of the thing that's on the left of the dot in a method call, sometimes called the receiver. Um, so it's called self. And then when you want to refer to any fields of the thing that you're implementing a method on, or you know, if it was an enum, you'd be able to match on it by referring to it as self. So you're just multiplying the self.first field by self.second. And, um, and then I can call that method here on anything that I know is a pair. So that's the basic syntax for methods. And it gets a lot more interesting than this. But first, I'm going to talk about generics. So that goes back to the question about options. So in Rust, functions can be abstracted over types and not just over values. And also, data types can be abstracted over other types. So data types can have parameters too, type parameters, I mean. And people will sometimes say generics, or they say polymorphism, which is the same concept. It's just different terms for it. I'm going to try to say generics to sort of evoke um, Java generics, which are at least somewhat similar to Rust generics. So here's the more general version of the option type that I talked about. So the syntax is meant to evoke C++ templates a little bit as well, but we don't have some of the problems that they do. Um, so here's a general option type. It's saying, well, if you have an option of a T, where a T can be any type, that's either a sum of a T or it's none. So you're just substituting in a new variable for the name that was int before. So here's how you would use this. So here's a function that either gets out the contents of an option or returns a default value that you also take as an argument. So I write my safe get function with a type parameter t, and I'm taking an option of a t, and then a t, and I return a t. And it's kind of hard to imagine what else I would do in the body. Either I get out the contents of the option or I return the default. So um, this is a very simple example, but just to show how generics work, uh, types, uh, yeah, go ahead. For the second parameter, why doesn't it have angle brackets? Oh, I see. I see what you mean. Um, so the angle brackets around the T mean I am declaring a type parameter T. So safe get has one type parameter T. So that's why that one has angle brackets. And then the angle brackets also get used to say, for this type option that has type parameters, I'm substituting in um, a particular type T. So this is confusing a little bit because T is getting used as a new variable that's being declared here. But here it's used as a concrete type. Yeah. And then default doesn't have to have the brackets because you're just referring to T. You're not filling it in anywhere. Um, good question. And um, yeah, so a little bit about how this is implemented. So type parameters don't have any meaning at runtime in, in your compiled code. So that sounds a little bit like C++ templates, but the difference is in Rust, we can type check each function separately. Type checking is totally separated out from expanding out generic functions at particular types, because the expanding out gets done during code generation, and type checking gets done up front. So you have separate type checking and separate compilation, and that means you don't have thousands of line error messages from one bad call, and everybody's a lot happier. Just to illustrate that, um, here on the left, you might write a couple of calls to safe get on different contained types, so ints or chars or bools. And then the compiler generates the orange code. So you can think of it, at least, as making a copy of the function with the type filled in at each instance. And I'm just showing the type signatures there. So in this way, um, 
we are able to generate efficient code because the code that we generate is all um, free of generics. It's specific to one type. And that means that our backend can do whatever optimizations on it that it would normally do. Um, so that's a simple implementation. And if you're saying to yourself, wow, this might generate a lot of code, it does right now, but we're working on ways to reduce that. And, and what that just means is that it could take a long time to compile your code, but when it's finally done, it generates fast code. Yeah? Yeah, in fact, that is this very slide <laughs> that I'm going to get into it. So good timing. Um, so interfaces. Um, interfaces are a pretty common concept in programming. Um, here is an example function that I might want to write. It takes uh, a list of elements of any type, t. Note that they all have to be the same type when you write it like this. So we have a list y's, and we have an element x. And we want to look at all of the elements in the vector and say, are they all equal to this one element that I passed in? So the code as it is doesn't type check uh, because of the code that I circled. So in Rust, you can't just compare any two things for equality, even if they have the same type. Rust has to have code for implementing the equality operation on that particular type. So because all we know about the things in the vector are that they're t, we don't know that they support the equality interface. This code isn't going to type check. Um, so we need, to be, we need a way to be able to express, well, I have a t here, but is it a t that implements the eek interface or any other interface? And we need a way to write functions that only make sense on things that support a particular interface. So, sorry. Yeah. That type check is done before when it's compiling the temp, the generic, rather than when it's trying to instantiate it for a given t. Right. It's going to complain. Even if, you, even, even if you never call this function, it's going to complain about it because inside this code is doing something to y and x that it doesn't know how to do because all it knows about, I mean, it doesn't know anything about y and x. So it doesn't wait until it knows what to use. Right. Yeah. Okay. So in Rust, we call interfaces traits. And if you know the term trait from earlier programming language research, that's great. But if you don't, that's fine too. Just think of it as an interface. And traits have implementations, which we write in Rust with the impl keyword. So here's an example. And this is also a real example from Sprocket NES, which is a NES emulator that my colleague Patrick Walton wrote in Rust. So this is a trait called mem that represents the memory of the Nintendo system. And because it's a 16-bit system, the address arguments are 16-bit unsigned integers. That's what U16 means in Rust. And you can load and store one byte at a time. So that's the U8 type. So what's going on here? So first of all, a trait is a collection of type signatures. Um, trait functions are called methods. And methods are different from functions because they have a special self parameter. So in this case, you can think of self as being a mutable reference to something. I don't know what that something is, but I know there's going to be an implementation of mem for it. So there's this kind of weird recursive thing going on here, if you think about it. But if you don't see what I mean by that, that's fine too. Itself is just the object that you're calling methods on. So load b loads a byte from memory. Store b stores a byte into memory. And this is saying a memory is just something that supports these two operations. So as per the question about can you have bounded polymorphism, so this is an example of bounds. So we can write a, functions called, a function called store two bytes. And this says, I'm going to take a type parameter t, but you can only instantiate me on types that implement the mem trait. And this is a made up example, by the way. But um, I'm going to take two addresses and two bytes, and then I'm going to take a mem, which is a mutable reference to a t. Um, and then I'm going to call the store byte method, which is not too surprising. So this is made up, but just to show you what a trait bound looks like. So you know, theory people call this bounded polymorphism, but you can just think of it as limiting a generic function to types that happen to have a particular interface. Yeah, you can have multiple interfaces. I don't have an example, but you can just write them all separated by the plus sign and go on your merry way. And so here's what an implementation of that trait looks like. 
So the, in the actual code, there's actually several different types of memories to represent the RAM and the VRAM and the PPU and something else, but I just picked one. So this RAM thing is just implemented as a struct with a field that is a vector of bytes that is a fixed length, as the comment says, 2K. And, um, and we write impl of mem for RAM. So you remember before, if you remember, I had that example of an impl that was just, it just had a type. It didn't have a trait. So it's used for two things. You can, first of all, you can just add methods to a type without writing a trait that those methods go in. But you can also say, I'm going to implement this trait for this type. And in the code that implements each of these methods, in the first case, I'm going to uh, mod this address by that particular constant so that I know that I get an address that's in range. And I'm going to index into that vector. And in the second case, I do the exact same thing, but I assign a value into it. So what's the important thing here? It's that the type RAM could be implemented any other way. It doesn't really matter as long as you were able to write implementations of these two methods for it. In general, yes. So we do have a feature called default methods that I kind of excluded because it's a little bit uh, buggy still. So that feature will allow you to have basically one default method, and then you can override it if you want to. But um, for now, at least, you can just think of it as if you want to implement a trait, you have to implement all the methods. Mm -hmm. Right. Is that a runtime, or does the compiler understand that that um, bitwise AMD is enforcing it? That's a really good question. So the question is, is the compiler going to know that the index in these two um, array indexes is always within bounds, or is that going to be checked at runtime? I suspect the answer is it'll still be checked at runtime. I'm not sure if the compiler is smart enough yet to do that optimization, but you know, in theory, it, it could. We kind of rely, we use LLVM as the backend, so we let that do a lot of the optimizations. And for all I know, there is a pass that would kind of see this, but um, I just don't know for sure if it does or not. There's certainly no promise that it won't be, um, that, you know, that it will be done statically. Yeah? But it is guaranteed that it would be done. It's guaranteed that it would be done. So if, if it was done at runtime and it was out of bounds, it would be guaranteed that you're program would fail and would not continue from that point. So I've been talking about methods. And if you know a little more about object-oriented programming, you know that you can have either static or dynamic dispatch. So in the code I've talked about so far, um, it's all compiled with static dispatch, which means that it's known at compile time what function you're calling. And that's possible because of the expanding out code at specific types that I showed you. Um, and that means that we kind of get static dispatch falling out of that for free. So static dispatch is efficient because whenever you call a function, you're calling a function in a known address. There is no indirect jumps, as we call them. But you also have the choice that if you have some particular part of your code that's not too performance critical, you can use dynamic dispatch. And, and note that if you're used to a language called Java or, or Python or Ruby, dynamic dispatch is all you have. So you may not even think about it, because that's just what you're doing all the time whenever you call a method. But in Rust, you have control over which one you're using. So here's an example of dynamic dispatch. So supposing we have a trait called drawable that draws whatever you give it on the screen. Um, we have this function called draw all, and that's taking a list of shapes. So shapes is a vector of objects that may all have different types. Maybe there's circles and rectangles and triangles. But all we know about them is that all of the types implement the drawable trait. And there is an at at the front to emphasize that these things are pointers. Uh, they have to be pointers because there has to be a, a v table, a lookup table, at runtime for passing around pointers to the actual method. So um, so that's how dynamic dispatch works. And it's really conceptually the same thing as the version that I showed you with the bounds on the functions, except that the choice of what method to call is done at runtime instead. And, and this is just showing you how the compiler handles that code. Um, on the left, we write that same code as before. Um, this is the static version, by the way. And it's just making copies, like I already showed you in the other examples.
And on the right, you can think of it as turning the code into something that dereferences out the view table, and then it says, where's the draw method in the view table? Um, I'm just going to call that on the shape. So um, you know, you could predict that that's what's going to happen, so you have a lot of control over what you're doing. So to sum up traits, um, we get code reuse, which is really important, because when we have to write the same code over and over in with a slight variation, something that's working on a slightly different type, we tend to make mistakes, because it's not going to be exactly the same every time. So we get code reuse for free if we use static dispatch. And then when you're willing to pay the cost, you can use dynamic dispatch. And the language doesn't really force you into one thing or the other. Um, standard library code generally isn't supposed to use dynamic dispatch just so that you can know that when you call standard library functions, you're calling things, things that are pretty efficient. So, um, so that's up to you as a programmer. And um, whatever choice you make, your code will still be type checked and you know you're not doing anything dangerous. Yeah. Can you go back and find Oh, sure. Uh, Oops. That's great. Um, well, you know that for whatever type it is, there was. Oh, I see. So um, since all we know about the type is that it has the drawable trait, the vtable would contain all of the methods that the drawable trait defines. So in this case, there's just one. So it would have just one element in it. I don't use it much personally, I have to admit. Um, and I don't think we use it much when implementing the compiler. Um, but it is one of the main uses for it is when you want to have a, a container, which is why I chose this example that has elements of different types that all implement the same trait. Because that's something you can't do with the syntax on the left when you're writing ampersand vector of t. They really, so t has to be um, substituted in with a single type, so they all have to have the same type. So, People say they want that sometimes. I honestly don't have a super compelling, non-contrived example off the tip of my tongue, but it's there if you want to use it. Right. Right. So I had a pause mark here for any questions that you've been. Oh, yeah, please. Thanks. For any questions you've been storing up um, about the first part, yeah. How close to prime time is uh, Rust? There's, there's still some debugging. Um, we've been focusing in the past uh, six to nine months on trying to stabilize the language specification itself, because that even that has changed fairly recently. And we're trying to have the specification pretty much frozen by the end of this year. So, And then about that time, at the end of the year, we want to release 1.0 of the compiler. We're currently on. 0.6. Um, so right now we have targets for um, 32 and 64-bit Windows uh, and Linux, as well as Macs. There's also a port to Android. So I don't know what particular ARM version they use, but there's some people at Samsung who are working with us on that, and uh, they did the Android port. So that's what there is so far. Um, besides Mozilla, and I mean, obviously, the people at Samsung are doing it because they potentially want to use it on their phones and tablets and whatever sometime. But um, I mean, I don't think we have any other big like corporate partners that I know of, but we have quite a few volunteers who have just found out about it one way or the other and come into the IRC channel. Um, but I don't know of any other like major commercial uses of it yet because we're kind of still at the point where if you want to do a serious, like a, a large Rust project, you kind of have to have Rust experts in, you know, in the room with you, or at least on IRC where you can reach them. Yeah, for sure. And I think that some of the Samsung people, at least, are trying to like start a real like South Korean Rust culture there. So not just people in their own company, but like other people uh, locally too. So that's cool. Yeah. 
we're trying very hard to make it subtractive at this point. Like we've already gotten rid of quite a few features. Like there was a feature. Yeah, there is a feature I worked on early on called type state that had to do with um, assertions that the compiler knew about it, which I thought was super neat, but it got the axe because we just needed to remove stuff. So um, another thing we're doing that I think is cool is in the, in the second half, I'm going to talk about uh, our optional garbage collection. So as it is, we have garbage collection that's part of the language, but you never have to use it. But we're talking about making that into a library, so it's not even part of the core language. So I don't know if we'll do that or not, but you know, the more things we can make into libraries, the simpler the core spec will be. So that's our goal. Yeah. Is there a plan for RAPL? For RAPL. Yeah, there is one um, called Rust-I that you can download and use. And I think some volunteers have given it quite a lot of love lately. So it does, so that works. Um, I mean, I don't use it much because when you're writing a compiler, it's hard to like debug that at a prompt. But, um, but it's definitely there. And, um, there, we have an IRC bot even that you could type code into and it'll run the REPL and evaluate it. So that works. Yeah. So do you have a type inference? Yeah. So uh, you can skip writing the types of variables. And as long as you write the types of functions at the top level, so arguments and results, we decided required. that's required. So we decided to draw the line there, both because it's good documentation. And um, it makes, we, well, we thought it would make the type inference a little simpler. I'm not sure how much it does, but yeah. Right, so I omitted that from the talk completely for obvious base reasons, but we have Erlang style concurrency in Rust, so lightweight tasks that communicate via message passing. And actually, the second part of the talk kind of relates to that because I'm not emphasizing it much, but the two kinds of memory that we have actually have to do with which things can be shared between tasks and which things can't be. Yeah. Yeah, I'll get to the kinds of memory, and I'll try to mention offhand that this has to do with tasks. We don't have them yet, but we are probably going to have them, right? So you couldn't define the general polymorphic monad trait. If you didn't know what that meant, don't worry about it. But, um, but yeah, we, it, it looks like we're going to have to add that. I'm not sure why we felt like we needed to, but we're adding it. Right. The answer, I think, is not much right now. Most of what Servo is using is uh, bindings that they've written to C libraries. So they've written an interface in Rust to it, but the actual code is you know, happening in some other C library. But that's because they kind of want to do this incrementally because you know, it's a browser. It's a huge task. So I think the plan is to write C bindings at first, but then once the, the, the thing basically works, to start porting all of those libraries into Rust. So, there's not a lot yet, but it would be a great area to work on for somebody. Anything else before I move on? Yeah. Since you're not going to talk about parallelism, I'm just curious, is it based in threads or process forks? Or? Yeah, it's based on tasks, which you can think of as multiple tasks could map to a single OS thread. So tasks are meant to be more lightweight than threads. Um, but there's no explicit locking or anything like that, because tasks just communicate my message passing. Okay, thanks. Okay, I better move on to make the time limit, but feel free to stop me still. So, change of gears. Um, memory in Rust, by the way, the background is a picture of core memory from among the first computers. Um, existing languages tend either to not have explicit pointers at all, so in Java or Haskell, you just you know never think about pointers, or support them without catching you in case you make one of a class of errors that are really common, like C and C++. But there is another way. So in Rust, we don't have the option of just letting all memory be garbage collected. That does make a lot of things simpler. But if you say to a systems programmer, everything's going to be garbage collected, they're going to run away. And even if you say we have optional garbage collection, sometimes they get scared. So people don't like garbage collection. And, and partly that's a technical thing. Partly it's a cultural thing. So the problem that we chose to take on was to allow some form of manual memory management, but to make it safe. So this is my one joke in the talk. And 
in the practice talk so far, people haven't even thought it was funny, so it ends up being really awkward, and I decided to keep it in because of that. So um, in just to, to go on a little bit about existing languages and what they do, so um, if you're programming in, um, in Java, say, um, things like pairs and records, you know, all those things are pointers, and if you have some code that's generic, um, that also gets box, which means putting it in a heap and making a pointer to it, because you need to know what size it is, and if the size isn't known at compile time, the compiler doesn't know how much space to allocate for it. So that's why we say uh, compilers box things to, to give them a uniform representation. But we wanted to avoid that in Rust because we don't want to have a lot of memory traffic. So here is a very simple example in Rust of what you can do. Um, the function on the left is uh, a function that takes an at pointer to a pair of ints, and I'm introducing the pair syntax for the first time, but hopefully it's pretty obvious. Um, and so that's taking a box, an app pointer that lives on the stack, but it's pointing to something in the heap, which is different from the stack. And then the function on the right takes just an unboxed pointer because there's no sigil on it, so in Rust you know that means it's stack allocated, and the two ints just get passed on the stack. So that might be good if you have decided in your program that the cost of copying that around is less than the cost of allocating stuff on the heap that might have to be garbage collected or ref counted or something like that. So the, the important thing is that we wanted to make stack allocation something that like, is really explicit in the language because systems programmers care about the difference between stack and heap because stack data has a sort of natural lifetime, lifetime that corresponds to the lexical scope of the program. So that means it doesn't need to be garbage collected and it doesn't need to be reference counted, so you want to use it whenever possible. So you may have heard that Rust has three kinds of pointers, and actually Rust has four kinds of pointers, but the secret that nobody mentions is that C++ does as well. It's just that they all happen to be spelled star t. So in C++, star t, for t being any type, can mean all kinds of different things. There might be any kinds, there's all sorts of possible expectations that you might have about that type, and the meaning in a given context in a program lives in the programmer's head. But in Rust, um, the pattern is explicit in the syntax, so the compiler can check what you're doing with pointers. Just to drive that home a little more, in Rust, we have pointers that are managed. So those are the at pointers that I've been showing you so far. And you can think of that as meaning garbage collected, although it's actually currently implemented with automatic reference counting. Um, new things, we have an own pointer to t, which I'll explain, which is spelled with a tilde and then borrowed pointers, which I've also shown you, but I haven't explained the difference so far, and I will. And finally, we have star team meant to look like the C version for good reason, because those are usually just used to communicate with li foreign libraries and stuff. So in C++, we have all these concepts too, it's just that they're spelled as asterisk T. So in Rust, um, you know, and you also may be familiar with references or with smart pointers in C++, which are pretty similar to these ideas in Rust, but again, we think that in Rust they're better integrated into the language and treated more uniformly, as I hope you'll see. Yeah? Does the syntax of star t uh, mean two things? Because you also do star and the variable. Right. It does mean two things. So at the type level, it means unsafe pointer to whatever. At the value level, in an expression, it means dereference this thing. And that was just kind of meant to look like c. So that's, if it's confusing, it's because c is confusing. So anything else? OK. So just to explain each of the pointers a little bit more. So manage pointers, here's an example of a function that takes one. Um, so it takes a mutable reference to a set, and we don't care how set is defined right now, and a manage pointer to a pair, and that pointer is a pointer into the heap. And we're calling it the local heap for reasons that actually have to do with tasks, which I think I'll get to in the next slide. And that heap is called manage because the caller doesn't have to manually free any pointers that are into it. You can just trust that the compiler or the runtime knows when it's no longer needed and will free it at the appropriate time in a way that, such that no dangling pointers get left behind. So when you're just kind of like writing code to start with and you don't care too much about performance, you want to use at. So here's what those tilde things are. They're called own pointers. So this is the, the task thing that I was talking about. So Conceptually, there is a global heap that all tasks can use to exchange uh, messages between themselves. And then each task has its own local heap. So I know I wasn't going to talk much about task, but this is like the one place where I'm acknowledge, 
acknowledging them. And each of the local heaps is garbage collected in a way that's task local. So other tasks can run while one of the tasks is garbage collecting. Um, the difference is that in the in the local heaps, there could be like lots of pointers and lots of cycles and stuff and, and sharing um, between different parts of the code, whereas any given allocation in the global heap has one owner. So there's one uh, there's one data structure or one block in the code that's responsible for freeing it when it's no longer needed. Um, so that's, I think, the one acknowledgment of tasks that I'll make in the talk. And it's also important to know that, as I showed with the arrows, pointers can point between the heaps. So you can have a local to global pointer and vice versa. Um, so by the way, I think a really cool thing that Rust type system does is preventing copies that you didn't intend to make. So um, here's something a little bit new. Here's a uh, vector with a tilde in front of it, which you can think of just being an owned pointer to a vector for now. Um, and what both of these function signatures mean is that H and G are taking their argument by value. And the reason for that is um, you're not allowed to copy something with a tilde in front of it. And um, moreover, uh, Vectors are expensive to copy, so the type so the compiler assumes that you don't intend to pass them by copy. So once one of these things gets uh, used in a call, so here we're creating a vector v and we're passing it to h. Um, h now has ownership of it, so v can no longer be used uh, within the body of f. And so the second call, the call to g, is going to be rejected because it, v is what we call linear or affine, which is just a fancy theory word for um, once you've used it, you can't use it again. So that is to prevent you from copying things that you probably didn't intend to copy. So at this point, the reference to v that's inside the body of f has gotten zeroed out. It's been moved, we say, instead of copied, and g is no longer able to use it. Yeah? That's a good question. So the question is, what if um, H and G were in an if statement? So the borrowed, uh, so the, the code that checks whether these pointers get used safely is what we call flow sensitive. Um, at least I think it is now. That was a change that was being worked on recently. So if if that work is finished, at least um, if so, say you say the code said like if whatever H of V else G of V. So that would pass because the compiler would know that oh. OK, I'm only going to take one of the branches of the if, so it's perfectly safe to do it in different branches. So it's, it knows about control structure, basically, is the less PL wonky way of saying that. Good question. Um, so borrowed pointers. Um, here's another function that creates a big vector and calls a function on it called sum. So assume that sum is going to just loop through the elements and add them all up. So Instead of taking its argument by value like the functions on the previous slide did, this type ampersand int tells us, well, sum is borrowing its argument. So that means that it can't return it as a result, because if it, if it returned it, we wouldn't know what the lifetime of it is going to be. Um, the, code, the compiler can look at this code and say, well, this is perfectly fine, because f is lending this big vector thing to sum, and when sum comes back, um, Big, there's not going to be any outstanding references to big vector. It's going to be done with big vector. So that's perfectly safe. And that means that the vector can be passed by reference. It doesn't have to be moved out of or copied. So I would used the ampersand before without defining it, but this is what it means. And the neat thing about this is that we can have multiple pointers to the same data structure that's not copyable. And that's going to be fine as long as we know which location is responsible for freeing it when it's no longer needed. So in this case, it gets freed after the call to sum before returning from f. Um, in more complicated examples, it's very useful to have that system so that we know that the compiler always knows when it's supposed to be free. Just to drive that home a little more about you know, what could happen if we didn't have the system, um, here's an example that won't compile. So we have some code that's making a cat, and then it's putting a reference to the cat into a webcam, which is just another data structure. And then it calls send cat to moon. So because we know that cat can't be copied, because even though I haven't shown it here, we're going to tell the compiler that um, 
and we're calling the send cat to moon function. We're passing the cat by value, so we know the cat gets moved out of. And once that's been called, we no longer have the cat. In the meantime, we still have the pointer to webcam, so we're going to call this take photograph function on it. And then we're going to call a method on, actually, I should say webcam, um, webcam.target.focus. And the point is, webcam has a pointer to a cat that's dangling, because we previously called this function on it that moved out of it. So um, that's what could happen if we didn't have our checking, and that's what the Rust type system uh, prevents. So just to drive the difference home a little bit more, in a language with automatic memory management, the cat and the webcam would be garbage collected, and the runtime would automatically figure out, OK, I know when there's no more pointers left to cat, and I know that's when I can free it. Um, but again, we don't want to pay that cost in Rust, and so this is kind of what was necessary. It, it's interesting to me because this system that we have didn't, it wasn't planned that way. No one really wanted to put it into the language. No one said, oh, I have this cool idea and I want to try it out in Rust. But it was just sort of what we had to do because we tried some other things and they didn't work. So um, it really feels like that was sort of the natural way to deal with manual memory management. So to summarize, borrow pointers, um, it's safe to borrow a pointer to data in a stack frame that will outlive your own. That's just kind of saying the same thing in a slightly more low-level way. So like if you have a pointer to something created by a function that called you, it's going to be in a stack frame that you know is still going to be around when you're done. Um, and it's also efficient because all of this reasoning gets done statically, and so borrowed pointers don't need to be managed in any way automatically. And if you want to write your code that way, you can write it completely using own and borrowed pointers, and that means that no GC will happen at all when you run your program. And Rust accomplishes both of these goals without making the programmer the sole party that has to reason about pointer lifetimes. You do have to think about them, but you can't mess up because the compiler will find your mistakes. So a question you, that some people ask at this point is, why bother anyway? I mean, you have to think about borrowed pointers, and you have to think about ownership when you're writing code in Rust. And there's lots of languages where you don't have to think about anything like that. So why bother? Well, I think it's cool that in Rust you can write these really common patterns, patterns that C and C++ people would write all the time, and know that you're not going to have dangling pointers and you're not going to have memory leaks. And moreover, if you were writing the same code in C or C++, you would still have to do all this reasoning if you wanted your code to actually work. So Rust makes you, Rust gives you something that you don't have in C, which is the tools that, to make that reasoning explicit so the compiler can help you check it. And the type system also helps you avoid expensive copies that you didn't need to do, so that's nice as well. And I have a bit that I'm going to skip, I think, in the interest of time. And just skip to the miscellaneous fun stuff at the end. So this doesn't, this has nothing to do with anything else, but um, we have a lightweight unit testing system that uh, the standard libraries use a lot. So here is an example. You don't particularly have to understand this code, but um, this is code that's testing the find method on hash maps. And we write this test attribute at the beginning, which has a hash and square brackets. That's how we write attributes. And then if you call the compiler on the command line with a particular flag, it will generate an executable that has code for all of the tests and this extra test runner driver code that wraps around it and prints out the test results nicely. So that's really handy. And we have something similar for benchmarking. Again, this, the details of this aren't too important, but it's a benchmark for our bit vector data structure. And if you write hash brackets bench at the beginning, and then you call resty with the dash dash bench flag, it generates an executable that runs all the benchmarks. But not just that, it runs them repeatedly and does some statistics on the results to make sure you're hopefully getting valid benchmark results. And that feature is still quite new, but I think it's really awesome. Um, and finally, uh, macros. You saw the assert bang and fail bang macros already. And those are really neat, as people who've used Scheme or Lisp know, among other things, because you can extend Rust syntax and not um, have to change the compiler itself. So here's how the fail macro, which we've seen, is implemented. It's just implemented by pattern matching on syntax. So you're allowed to have a fail with no argument, in which case it gets turned into a fail with, an, a, with a random string in it. And that uh, gets expanded again recursively. 
into the second case where if you have a message, it's saying I'm going to call the standard fail function with file and line, which are also macros. Yeah. Assertion. Yeah, it's inspired by the syntax rules uh, keyword in Scheme, which is, uh, you know, in Scheme, the meaning of it is, okay, here are some rules for transforming the syntax. But as a guy named, I think, Albert Lai said about that, um, time flies like an arrow, um, fruit flies like a banana, syntax rules like a macro. So the, the pun has been noticed. So it's not arbitrary? No. Right, good question. So the question is, is it matching on parsed code or more likely C preprocessor? Is it matching on uh, plain text? And it's, it's basically matching on the ASTs, so the parsed version of the code. There's actually two kinds of macros, which I didn't mean, into, mean to get into, but you can match either on token trees, which kind of gives you a closer to the source um, representation of the code, or you can match on ASTs if you don't care about that so much. So there's documentation on this that you, know, you can read if you're curious. So, um, so I think the neat thing is like assert and fail were both core parts of the language. At one point, they were keywords. And then we were able to move them out of the compiler and make them uh, macros. So there's just less to maintain in the compiler, which is always a good thing. Um, and one more random thing is that you can automatically derive certain traits. Um, so for the option type, say you can derive the equals type, which will give, or the equals trait, which will give you equality on options of anything that supports equality itself. So this is something that was inspired by Haskell, basically for certain types, uh, certain traits that the compiler knows about. The compiler will implement those traits for you in the most obvious possible way. And this is often used for the to stir trait, which will convert things to strings. Um, and, uh, and that can be really useful. Um, because you know maybe at first you don't want to write a ton of boilerplate code. So I'm going to end here and thank the REST team, without which all, none of this would be possible, and all of our many, I think more than 100 now, contributors who are listed there. And um, I wanted to suggest that if anybody like really had fun and wants to organize a REST hack party during the unconference day, they should. I won't be here for that, unfortunately, but um, I think it would be really cool if people did. So I'll take more questions. Yeah. So the performance on, on micro benchmarks compared to C is very good. But of course, micro benchmarks always only tell you so much. So I think we won't really know the answer until we have bigger applications written in Rust. So Servo is part of the attempt to answer that. And if that works out well, and it'll show, you know, hey, we can actually write a browser engine in Rust. And, and then the people who have spent more of their lives working on browsers will take over from there and make something more production ready. Um, nothing really yet. I mean, it's it's been on the it should be a good idea list for a long time, but it's not been a priority for the core team because there's so much else to do. But anybody could come along and contribute one. We have an Emacs mode, so yeah. Well, I think I would suggest tip because we're pretty close to releasing 0 0.7. That should be in the next two to three weeks. So if 0 0.7 is out, that I think should be perfectly fine. But it's changed somewhat since 0 0.6 in a way that's user visible. So in general, the newest release that you have the patience for <laughs> is probably the best one. Any other questions? Well, thanks, and uh, I have some stickers, so please take one. <laughs>